right. Good. Well, morning. I'm just going to keep on saying good morning every time. Um, the time has come finally to uh, for, for me to take the stage properly, not just introductions, but talk about what Axonic has been up to and what we are up to next. Um, of course, the uh, original idea was to have this uh, this talk in the morning and have it repeated in the uh, in the afternoon. But right now, I can guarantee you everything you'll see right now is fresh off the press. So basically, let me start with a little summary. And I think that summary is valid not just of last year, but for this day as well. But what a year. Um, 2020 will go into the records of history, into the event log of history as a year where everything was different than what we're used to. And unfortunately, it is also a year where we had to deal with a lot of setbacks. Some of you might have had some personal setbacks, maybe uh, had to fight to get your job or uh, lost someone you, uh, you loved. And it was, it was a year where we needed to find a different way to get things done. Um, so I was used to, and I was getting a lot of energy from traveling around and meeting people, doing sessions like these, where you, with high interaction, you, you model domains and you find out what people are trying to achieve in their, in their business and find out how you can build software for them. Those were interesting days. And this is a picture taken, well, actually in 2020, it was in January where I was in uh, San Francisco for a, uh, for a training. And this was, I think, the last in-person training that, uh, well, I expect to do this year. And Fortunately, we've been able to, to travel around the, in the past few years, travel around quite a lot. And these are actually all the locations I could remember having been, or at least someone of us uh, at, at Exonic has been in recent years to either do a talk, visit a customer, or, or do these, these modeling sessions. But on this one day, and I don't even recall which day it was, to be honest, but it was uh, pretty sure somewhere in, uh, in March, um, we have this picture on our television. This is the Dutch Prime Minister in his, well, in our version of the Oval Office. It is very nice and small. It's a very small corner. He's got the smallest office, I think, that you can get in any government. And why is this so special? Well, it didn't happen anywhere uh, in my, during my life, uh, slightly before it happened when we had the oil crisis. But it does show the, well, the, the big, different environment that we were in and how we had to, uh, to deal with, uh, with these changes. We had to stay at home, work from home. Fortunately for us, that was not a big deal, but um, schools were closed and you had kids at home and working with your kids around, that was a different experience. This is a picture that shows how my life was different. Uh, I used to sit in those, but you can see pretty clearly that, well, if you park, start parking planes on a runway, they're not going anywhere. They will stay where they are, there's no travel. So we had to find a way to, to get these modeling sessions going again. We cannot stop modeling. We do not want to stop building better software with our, uh, with our partners and our, and our customers. Well, the answer is easy. Well, at least it sounds easy. And it was like, let's go online. Let's do an online training. But we also know from experience that a training session that is done online has a different way of interaction. The, the level of interaction is different. I wouldn't say higher or lower, but definitely different. And we wanted to make sure that we could deliver the same quality training as we did before, but now in a different format, mainly online. And as a trial, we decided to make a very short version of a training. Uh, we called it the fast lane. And we decided to do that short version online just to see if there's people interested in following online trainings. And of course, it was free. It was uh, relatively short, uh, two to three hours uh, max. 
and, uh, and we just gave it a shot. We planned our first online training, and I remember the marketing guy saying, well, let's plan one in three weeks from now. We don't want to wait too long. And I was like, three weeks, that's way too short to, to organize, to get people interested and, and know about this training session. Um, so we opened it up. We had a Zoom account for, for 100 attendees, but we said we want to limit that to more or less 50. I think 50 is a comfortable size where we can still have somewhat of interaction, but um, yeah, if it gets larger than that, we're probably going to lose that. One week after, we had 400 registrations. Um, that was 300 stories that we had to, to tell to people and ask them to join another session. Um, I, I can only say that, well, the, the free training has been, has been a success. We've had uh, seven sessions in a row with, uh, with 100 attendees, and uh, we're still organizing every, um, every month uh, one of these uh, free Axons, uh, Axon trainings, the fast lane trainings. But we also started to do the full training online, and that was also different because we were used to doing two days, very intense two days together, just from early in the morning to late in the evening, including evening drinks, discussions, you know, follow-ups. Uh, that was important to us. But online, you can't really do that, definitely not in the time zones. So we uh, decided to cut them up in smaller pieces and do eight modules of two hours instead of two days of eight hours. Um, I think that worked pretty well. We're getting good feedback. So we're very happy that we got that training schedule going again. So if you're interested, definitely go to, uh, to our website and check whenever the next training is. You don't actually have to wait for us to be in the neighborhood anymore. I guess that's a good thing. So right now, we just have one location, and that's Earth. And maybe even beyond. I'm not sure how far uh, Wi-Fi will actually reach. In the meantime, um, good things happened as well, right? It's not all bad news and it's all not all about change. Sometimes it's about lines going up, right? Um, every company summary should at least have one graph of a line going from the bottom left to the top right. Now here's one, and this is a line that starts when, when the company started, well, actually way before, it's uh, 2015. And these are the number of downloads that we had up till we, um, um, we started our, our conference in, uh, in September 2018. And I was really proud that we could announce that we had crossed the total of 1 million downloads for Axon Framework. And we were so proud that last year we, we repeated that and we said, yeah, we were so proud of having, two, uh, having 1 million downloads. But now, last year, we've got two and a half million total downloads. That's a nice 2.5 X over one year. It also means that in that year, we had more downloads than we ever had before in the 10 years pre preceding it. I cannot quite say that this year, but I am still proud that it's been going up. And right now we've had 2 million downloads just in the last 12 months. That is almost as much as we had in all the 10, 11 years before that. Um, and that must indicate that there is interest in, in what we are building. And it's uh, apparently um, we're, we're delivering something that brings value. And I hope that the case studies you've been able to watch up till now um, show the different use cases where that has brought value and maybe also where that uh, where there were some, some caveats or some, some downsides. Um, we are not done yet, as we'll see later. Still, the most asked question we get in any uh, customer interaction, or at least interaction before they actually become customer, is, does anyone use this in production? It doesn't matter if you have four and a half million downloads. If can, they, everybody just cares about that one project in production. And I know you know that there's projects in production because we've seen some case studies and, uh, and, and they are in production with this, uh, with this software. It has been used in production before it was actually, well, in the time where I still called this an experiment, right? Companies already brought it into, into production. 
And the other question that I struggle with answering definitely is, what is the typical use case for Axon? And it's a question that I get every time over and over again. And if you know the answer, please let me know through chat, interaction, whatsoever, because I can't find it. I've actually stopped answering that question. Um, in the initial days, definitely before we started Axonic, I was convinced that CQRS was a niche solution, only viable for those few cases where you had a highly audited environment, you had preferably financial transactions to monitor, you needed to know exactly the, the origin and destination of every penny. But I think the use cases have already made clear that that is not the case. So last year I presented a number of, or I talked about a number of use cases that I've, I've come across. And they, they go from car manufacturing to well, dealing with secondhand cars, from getting your driver's license in the Netherlands, from buying flowers in a flower shop, the actual um, flower market, the, the buying and selling of flowers in the Netherlands is, is partly uh, uh, managed by Axon-based applications. Uh, supermarket change, uh, chains, uh, logistics. Uh, we've got government agencies. If you, if you own any property in the Netherlands, that is registered through an Axon-based application. Um, the Dutch power grid, I've heard, is also uh, coordinated, or some parts of it are managed through Axon-based applications. And then there's obviously the banks. But every time we come across this, these fantastic use cases, and, and I... I really get inspired by how people use a product that was basically born out of this, uh, out of an experiment and find different ways where it can bring value in their specific case. And in the last year, we've seen beautiful use cases of international trade and, uh, and uh, high volume logistics, as well as air traffic control systems that apparently uh, use Axon to uh, to gather and process radar data and, and optimize uh, airplane uh, flows. Hopefully they still do that uh, today, even though there's a lot less air, air traffic these days. There's government agencies that uh, take care of the um, child benefits. Uh, we've seen uh, VDAB with their, with their talk about uh, the, their, their, their platform about uh, unemployment. Um, images from uh, um, medical images. Uh, we've seen the Ecosi platform use case uh, today and it will be repeated uh, after again. And finally, there's one use case and I, that one never, I would have never imagined that would be and remotely a use case for Axon is the photorealistic rendering of fabrics. Apparently, one of our customers has used Axon to not only manage the logistics of their fabric, fabrics, where they have you know, large volumes of fabrics coming in that are then cut into smaller pieces to transport to their clients, but they've also worked on a platform to make a photorealistic rendering possible of those fabrics so that the architects that intend to use those fabrics will be able to make a realistic rendering of what it will look like if you were to use that specific fabric as curtains for the couch, for, the, uh, for, for any, anywhere in your house. Um, and that is amazing. And they have a huge platform to, uh, to manage that, uh, that rendering uh, uh, on, uh, on Amazon. So again, I'm going to repeat what I said last year, right? Last year I said, yeah, Axonic is everywhere. Um, and I thought, well, that must be it, right? We've seen the use cases now, and from now on, it's just gonna be more of these, right? And it's not, it's now in even more places. And I guess that's still fine. It was fine last year. I guess that's okay. Um, and it's, it's really amazing. And um, yeah, right now I'm just uh, here in a, in a studio talking to a camera. So unfortunately I will not be able to have uh, uh, these really nice conversations, but I'm sure we'll have follow-up talks and I'll, find out about even more use cases. And if you have something, just let me know because that is really what inspires us to keep on building and doing what we're doing and finding out uh, what's, what's next. 
But before we go into what's next, what have we been up to? So online trainings, of course, uh, in, uh, finding out about new, uh, new use cases. But we also had a couple of releases in the past year. Um, Axon 4.3 was earlier this year. And we added a couple of features, and these are only the, the main features. If you're interested in the details, you can check out what, uh, uh, check out on, uh, on, on the, in the, the documentation, the reference guide. We have a, a detailed overview of all the features that are in each of the uh, framework and server versions. But in 4.3, we added backup nodes because we found out that many of our clients wanted to have multi-data center replication just in order to make sure that they had a copy of the data in another data center should anything happen. So we added the feature of backup nodes in, in 4.3 uh, of Axon Server. We also noticed that a lot of people wanted to run Axon Server in containers, much more than we actually anticipated. So we built a number of features, especially with uh, using environment variables for configuration to make sure that uh, Axon would, was easier to configure when run in a, in a container. And one of, these, uh, one of these features was the auto-clustering feature. It would allow you to predefine inside a file which nodes you expect to be part of the cluster. So when you would spin these nodes up, they would recognize themselves in that list and initialize the cluster automatically. That makes adding new nodes to a cluster a lot easier. All you need to do is, is put that file in there and automatically when it starts up, it will register itself with uh, one of the uh, existing nodes in the cluster. And people found that to be a, use, uh, a useful use case, um, but it wasn't quite spot on yet. So as we progressed into 4.4, we had um, a lot of new, uh, new possibilities. Um, one of them was tag-based message routing. So location awareness was something we added in uh, 4.2, if I'm not mistaken. And that allowed clients in a specific location to, to connect to an Axon server instance that was closest to that application. And especially in multi regional deployments, that has proven to be very useful and efficient to make sure that a message that has to travel from, from one data center to another doesn't need to travel three times because it was connected to the wrong Axon server instance. But then sometimes you just want a specific message to be routed to a specific destination. And in Axon 4.4, we added that possibility that by adding metadata that matches the tags that you use in Axon Server, you can actually uh, direct that message to a specific uh, region, for example, and make sure that the message gets handled on, a, uh, on an application that is in a specific region. One of the biggest, let's say, performance or scalability benefits that we, we have in 4.4 is the concept of read from follower. Especially when reading events, it is very important that we are able to read, to do consistent reads. We want to be able to guarantee that the information you read is the committed and actual data. However, we also found that that requires all the reads to be directed to the leader of a cluster, which is only one node of potentially five, seven, or however large your cluster is. That makes that one node a performance bottleneck. In 4.4, we've diverted most of the read operations to followers, which makes that very scalable and only have that small portion of uh, consistency that we require to be read from the leader. And that is generally only information that has potentially not been replicated yet, but has been, uh, has been committed, but the followers aren't aware of that commit. I will not go into technical details, um, but this will, uh, make the, the um, scalability of a, of a cluster much, uh, much better. We have a lot of clients storing massive amounts of data, hundreds of millions of events per day. When you do that, it is not unlikely that the disks of your primary nodes get filled up. And that is something we want to prevent. A full disk is the best way to crash any system. 
So we added a feature to, um, to store an overflow of data onto other servers, in, servers instead. So you can have a, let's say, second line of Axon server nodes that replicate all the data, but they can have larger and slower disks. All the data is automatically replicated to those nodes and they can be evicted from the primary nodes. So you can keep that data relatively small, just a few billion messages, uh, just a few terabyte if you want to, but at least you can limit that storage. And also in a five node cluster, you'll have five copies of every, of every event. With multi-tier storage, by uh, moving the data to secondary nodes, you can choose a different scale for those secondary nodes. It is probably data that is less frequently accessed. So two copies might be enough. When reading information from such large data volumes, we, we needed a better index for looking up aggregates. We, we found out that sometimes to load an aggregate, we still had to go far too, to go back too far to find the events. And even though that is a relatively rare use case, it doesn't happen as frequently as we would have more recent events being read, we noticed that the, the price to pay on, on those reads was too high. So we sat down and we designed a different index type that allows us to much faster go back in time and find the relevant events inside the data segments that we have stored, making it fast to validate whether an aggregate exists and which files exactly we need to, uh, to load those events. Maybe one of the most obscure features that we added, or obscure in the sense of least clear, is the concept of replication groups. What we've done in 4.4 is we have separated the concept of a context, which is a conceptual separation, a logical separation of data and, and rights to access that data and rights to interact between uh, applications. We've separated that from the technical aspects of replication and, um, and, and transaction logs. The replication group is the technical part. You can define a replication group to say, well, we will have three primary nodes in specific data centers, and we will have backup nodes or um, uh, secondary nodes in different data centers. And then you define the context on top of the, uh, that replication group. And every replication group will then follow those, those patterns automatically. They will share a transaction log, uh, but at least you can still define the, um, the logical access rights and, uh, and interaction through the, uh, the context that are on top of that. Especially for, uh, for systems that have a requirement for a large volume of contexts. Uh, originally, we designed it for about 10 contexts, but we already have customers that have hundreds. Um, and then the replication groups are the way to make sure that uh, it is uh, technically, be, technically feasible to run that on a relatively small number of nodes. The last feature on this list is actually a follow-up on the auto cluster feature. We, uh, we heard that people liked the auto cluster. It made it easier to set up, especially for test environments, but also for, for local development and in some cases for production, we, we heard that it, was, it helped setting up the, the cluster, but then just adding nodes to the cluster wasn't enough. We wanted to be able to define the outcome, the end result of how we wanted the, uh, the cluster to work. So which replication groups do we have? Which context do we expect to run on each replication group? Um, which authorizations do we want to give to applications? And in 4.4, you can add a complete cluster template file, pass that on to every node you want to run, and it will automatically join the cluster and make sure that every context or every replication group, every authorization that it needs to define is automatically defined. And we just hope that these features make your life easier to do the hard job that you are doing when, when building your applications, because honestly, it's still hard. We just want to make it easier for you. 
So what kind of features can we expect from here? And this is always a challenge because what we do not want to do is sit in, our, in an ivory tower and say, okay, this is a cool feature. We actually want to discuss those with you and hear from you what you think is important. And that interaction for us is extremely important. So all we have for beyond 4.4 are themes that we will be working on. And one of these themes is, was, is, and probably will remain for, for, the, uh, for the time to come, error handling and observability. Uh, the, the larger these systems get and the more complex the use cases get, uh, we've heard from VDAB that they have uh, around 10 teams of, of 10 people each. Well, that is a big organization for, for a project. Um, you definitely want to have good observability in such a system to make sure everything keeps working the way it's working. So anything we can do to improve that, let us know and we will. We have some ideas ourselves, obviously, uh, but any feedback you have is important. On the error handling part, we have noticed that the two options we provide right now out of the box are not sufficient. Basically, log and continue or stop and retry. And there's an intermediate solution, and we know there's a, uh, there's a way to do that. We just cannot find a nice way, a workable way uh, to, to deliver that in a generic way for you to, uh, to use. And it's basically the error listing of events. Right? When an event is, uh, generates an error, to put that on a queue and make sure it gets processed later on. Right? Still, um, respecting the ordering guarantees that you have on a specific, a specific event will only get handled after another one is handled. So if that other one is error, uh, generates an error, we want the second one to be queued as well. That's something we will be working on. We really hope we can get that in a, in a 4.5 release. It's just not easy. Another thing is the flexibility of modeling and messaging, and definitely the design part of the messaging. We want modeling to not be restricted in any way by Axon Framework. We know that there's, uh, there's some discussions going on about the annotations on, on the methods, um, but we do that as a compromise to allow you to at least generate or create the aggregates that you want, and by, by putting those annotations on that you mark specific methods uh, with uh, specific responsibilities or stereotypes, if you will, so that Axon can add its behavior and behavior onto that. But we see different uh, requirements on changing uh, aggregate structure. And sometimes that's really trivial with event sourcing and sometimes it's more complex. And, and we hear the, uh, the challenges and we look for, uh, for better solutions and as, as uh, with all the other features, we have ideas, but we are definitely looking for any, any feedback or any ideas that you may have. Well, related to observ observability somehow, but even before that, tools for developers to make it easier to work with Axon. There are still a few operations, for example, that require access to the UI or API of Axon Server that would have been nicer if you could set those from the application itself. So we're thinking about a, an administrative API from an application to Axon Server to say, well, I've got these um, um, event processors and I expect certain behavior on them. I want to be able to, to target a split or a merge, or sorry, to trigger a split or a merge, or I want to be able to set a specific load balancing strategy that I want to use to make sure that all instances of an application are um, processing a similar load on the, uh, on the, from the event stream. That kind of uh, interaction is something that we'll be looking into. And the same for operations. We've noticed that some, uh, sometimes operations just want to take a production um, environment and create, that, uh, create a um, an acceptance environment or a test environment from that production data. Um, so we, we're looking into building tooling to make that easier and make a lot of those, uh, those operations much easier to do. Not last and definitely not least is language interoperability. It is possible to use Axon Server 
uh, where in combination with any language. The APIs are already language agnostic. We only provide a Java client for now out of the box, but that does not mean that any Axon application or even non-Axon applications can interact with other non-Axon applications. But we also see that some of the defaults that are used might not be as interoperable as we like. The uh, fully qualified class names for, for the payloads that are passed along, they might not match the, the class names that you expect on the other side. And again, we have some, some ideas on, on implementing and improving um, uh, existing functionality to make sure it gets easier and more transparent to work with Axon uh, from or to interact with Axon from different uh, different languages. And then last, but also not least, reactive. Reactive is a, well, it's just a word, but it can mean a lot of things. Um, and for us, reactive is important in two different aspects. It is important as in reactive programming. And very recently, we have started a reactor extension using Project Reactor, uh, Project Reactor's APIs to allow you to interact with the command bus and the uh, query bus and the event bus in a more uh, reactive way in the sense of reactive programming. It is a programming model that well, you have to get used to, I guess. But once you're used to it, it allows you to decouple the actual processing from the threading much better and gives you very powerful tools to reliably, yet in a multi-threaded way, handle all of these events. It provides a good means to, to organize back pressure. Um, so this extension is something that we're building next to Axon Framework, but we are planning to, to integrate that more in the future. And right now we are experimenting with different APIs and, and looking at how we can improve the way you interact with Axon to make it more reactive. But reactive also has another meaning. Reactive systems is a whole different game. Reactive systems are about resilience and how does it deal with error? How does it deal with changes, either functionality changes or changes in, in the non-functionals? But if more, more, more people hit your platform, is your your platform, is your system scalable? Um, and there's a lot of aspects in Axon that help you build reactive systems, but there are still a lot of uh, benefits that we can, uh, we can tap into. And recently, um, Jonas Bonaire wrote an article with the help of several, as he calls them, distributed uh, experts, uh, distributed systems experts, um, he wrote um, the reactive principles, and this is definitely a document that is worth uh, reading. So principles.reactive.foundation, I believe, is the, is the URL to go to. And I'm very proud to have been able to contribute uh, to, that, uh, uh, to that document and, and to have my name in between a list of people that I admire and respect a lot. Um, so it's pretty, uh, pretty nice to have our, our name in there but it's not just the name we want in there. This is uh, basically what we fundamentally believe is the best way to build software. Uh, and based on that foundation, we, uh, we add the CQRS and, uh, and DDD and event sourcing ingredients to make the system not only reactive and very powerful, but also a system that knows where it came from and can use that data for uh, more advanced uh, features in the future. But let me, don't let me go to the foundations of CQRS. But the changes in Axon or Axonic are not just about features. Our team has grown in the past year as well. And actually I didn't check how large we were last year, but we definitely have a lot of new team members. And as of today, our team is exactly 30 people. So we have a new person join the team today. Otherwise, I would have said, I would have had to say almost 30 people. I'm glad we can say 30. And those 30 do not include two members that we can add to our team as advisors, if you will, 
who are uh, well in these cases they they advise their uh, their mummies especially on when it's feeding time and, and time to leave the computer but still um, they they look pretty uh, pretty handsome in their little uh, axonic uh, rumpers. Our team is also quite diverse. We've got uh, people in the ages of 24 to 60. Um, I'm, I'm very happy to be on the younger half of this, uh, of this group. Uh, that makes me feel young. Um, and we have more than 25% women. Well, it would have been nice to say 50-50 because that is, well, statistically what it should be, I guess. Uh, but in tech, that is, uh, that is always a challenge. Um, and I'm, I'm really happy that also in our tech, uh, we've, got, we've got it all. More about that in a second. Our team consists of 13 nationalities uh, located in seven countries. And that is really awesome because, well, I like to travel. And um, while not being able to travel, at least I can still interact with people on a daily basis with different backgrounds. But that also means that if we have something to celebrate, that we cannot just put up a toast and just put our glasses together. Unfortunately, that requires a Zoom session and bring your own drinks. Uh, BYOD has a completely different meaning at Exonic than it has in many other companies. Um, but yeah, if you just hold a laptop with a Zoom session, uh, this is our, uh, our team. Well, minus one, you had to hold the camera um, in, uh, in, in Belgrade. And uh, we are having a Zoom session to just celebrate one of the uh, many successes that we had in the last year. The people we have in our team have so many different backgrounds and so many different ways of looking at a problem. And that is sometimes a challenge um, because, well, it, it is always easy to, uh, to think you're right. But in, this, uh, in a team like this, everybody has their own view. And we have risk takers, we have analytics, we have people, people, we have extroverts, introverts, uh, people that focus on details. I guess the quality nerds are the ones that focus most on details, almost like overly passionate about some things. Um, maybe that's me, I don't know. Um, we have some people that are more uh, strategic and are very creative and think about solutions that you would never anticipate were possible. But there's one aspect that we all have. We love to learn. We all know that we do not have the absolute answer to anything, actually. And the only thing we can do is do our best, try, learn, maybe fail, because that is failure is the best learning experience. Of course, we don't want to fail too often, uh, but failing on, uh, on some things is, uh, is, a, is a good experience. So some of the things we've learned is that our documentation was not really up to par. And we, we have new people on the team. And these people started to look at the documentation and said, well, that is not the kind of documentation that if you're really new to Axon, where you can find the things that you're looking for, or if you already know some things about Axon, but want to get to specific details, that you can find them. And Vijay Nir was one of the people who said that, and he basically switched the whole documentation around and restructured all of our documentation. Now you might think, Vijay Nair, have I heard that name before? Well, you probably have. You might actually have his name on your bookshelf. He's the author of Practical Domain Driven Design in Enterprise Java. Um, which I had the pleasure of reviewing one chapter of, which is about Axon, uh, Axon Framework. Um, his book sold very well, so congrats on, on that. Um, and uh, well, if you don't have a copy yet, it is definitely worth, uh, worth reading. And then we have our mailing list. Do you remember our mailing list? It has served us for over 10 years. Um, it, was, it was started in the early, well, 2010, somewhere. We have had over 2,500 questions that needed 11,000 messages for the question to be asked and the reply to be given. And we have had 1,250 people participate in these interactions. 
I think that's quite a lot, especially if you consider that of those 10 years, the first few years only had very little interaction with maybe one question a week. Most of that interaction really happened in the last three to three and a half years. And that was really difficult to manage for us. And you might have noticed that getting answers on the questions on those mailing lists is, was difficult. It was difficult for us to find the unanswered questions. Um, and that's why we decided to cancel and to terminate the mailing list and not use that anymore. But of course, we don't want to lose our way of interacting with you. So Milan Diankov, also a new uh, team member, he's a developer uh, advocate at, uh, at Exonic. He came up, he uh, built a discuss.exonic.io. And that is a platform where you're, you're able to interact, not just with us, but with the entire community. And we can much better track if there's any unanswered questions or questions that really require the assistance of the Exonic engineering team or DevRel team to, uh, to answer. So we really invite you to go there, create an account and, and mix, uh, get, get, uh, interact with us. And the last person I'd like to mention uh, is uh, Sarah Tori, who also joined us very recently. And she was amazed by the number of interesting stories that we had that, that needed to get out there. And not only stories of ourselves, but also stories from the community. And she uh, set out to, uh, to start a podcast, of which we've had uh, six sessions uh, so far. It's fairly new. If you go to podcast.exonic.io, you can find these sessions. You can listen to them on, on any device you like. Um, and um, personally, I think they're really nice. I really enjoy listening to that. Well, not to my own, but to my, my fellow, uh, my colleagues' uh, podcast sessions. I really enjoy listening to those. Sarah has a really nice way of asking the questions that maybe we take for granted. And she's really good at finding those. But what is it exactly that you mean with that? And the last thing I want to, uh, or another thing I want to mention is extensions. We've, we've, we've developed a number of extensions onto the framework by now, and many of those have had an involvement of the heroes of the community. And uh, for example, the tracing extension, Kafka extension and Kotlin extension are heavily contributed by, uh, by the community. And that's really what we value. And we would really like to encourage you to, if you have an idea, to at least let us know uh, we are planning to, uh, to make those extensions much more visible and accessible and make sure you get the help from the engineering team to, uh, to build them. And another thing we've noticed is there is a lot of information out there, interesting case studies, how-tos, backgrounds, patterns, back practices, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of information, not only by us, not only by you, but also by others uh, not maybe not even axon related, but still interesting to read. And we are working on a developer portal that links that information and, and makes that more accessible so that you can find background information much more easily. We are not quite ready yet to publish this, but this is uh, something that we are, uh, we're working on to make sure we can, uh, we can get that information out. The last topic um, with the, uh, the end of this session nearing is last year we pre-announced the cloud.exonic.io and that has been somewhat of a journey. Um, making a platform accessible yet secure, open yet safe to use is a big challenge and we have to find the right balance between that openness and the security. Uh, but we are making good progress and Actually, it is live as of this moment, still in beta, but it is live and ready for you to, uh, to use and enjoy. Um, we will be making uh, public announcements uh, very, uh, very soon uh, and, and make it more, uh, more public than, than we do right now. But you can go to console.cloud.exonic.io, just register using your uh, GitHub or Google, <clears throat> Google account and get a free account. And that brings me to today, 1st of October 2020. Half of that day is already gone if you're in Europe, uh, to the event-driven microservices conference of 2020. We have 15 different sessions um, uh, repeated throughout two days. Some of those sessions we've already gone through. Uh, the idea was to have this session in the morning, 
but we had to uh, uh, to, to reschedule some uh, some of these sessions due to technical problems we had this morning. They're scattered around two days, so if you're not done today, don't worry. There's another day tomorrow, and we'll have good fun tomorrow again. And again, I would really like to thank our sponsors, Trifork, Cross, and GoTo for supporting us in this journey. Um, the, uh, I hope you've been able to, uh, to interact with them. Uh, they all gave, uh, gave presentations uh, today, uh, and uh, your, uh, your information and additions to this, uh, uh, to this conference are highly valued. And don't hesitate to go to those sponsors and then interact with them. Uh, you can ask anything to these guys and girls. So just ask, discuss, learn, but most of all, enjoy. Thank you.